with our friends at Paul Pratt Library and also our friends of Cohasset Elder Affairs together. Um, Tom is a Dublin-born folklorist and singer who has played at concerts, festivals, colleges, libraries, and pubs worldwide. Uh, and it looks like he has brought a few little in implements of uh, destruction. destruction here to entertain you today with a little Irish music. So welcome, Tom. Thank you so much. So the first thing I'm going to do for you is a song from Belfast, where my mother was born, and it was the first folk song I learned as a kid. It's called The Bell of Belfast City. When she was a child, she was taken with her family to see the biggest ship in the world being built in their little backwater of a sectarian city, Belfast. And they were marveled at this. They were so lucky to be chosen to build this big ship. And everybody in Belfast is so proud of it. So several years ago, I visited the Titanic Museum. It's very interesting. Has anybody been up to see it? Yeah, oh, very good. And it's state of the art. It's very well presented. And they don't shirk the social distinctions between Catholics and Protestants who got the good, who got the poor jobs, and so forth. However, there was one lad walking around the cafe wearing a T-shirt that read, it was all right when I left here. <laughs> Um, I, uh, you can all hear okay, and not, not too loud or anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. I tell my mom when I go home, the boys will leave the girls alone. I pull my hair, stole my comb, that's all right till I go home. She's handsome, she is pretty, she's the belle of Belfast City. She's a court, up to three, please come and tell me who is she. Um, he says he loves her, all the boys are fighting for her, knocking the door, ringing the bell, only to look there they well out, she comes white as snow, rings on her fingers, bells on her toes, out to the body, then she dies, drunk in the cow with the rolling eye. I tell me now, when I go home, the boys will leave the girls alone, pull my hair, sew my comb, that's all right till I go home. She is handsome, she is pretty, she's the bell of Belfast City, she's a She's as sweet as apple pie. She get her own that by and by. When she gets out of her own, won't tell them out when she gets home. Let them all come out, say, well, it's how her booty she was done. When I go home, the boys won't leave the girls alone. They pull my hair, stole my comb, that's all right till I go home. She's handsome, she's pretty, she's the girl of Belfast City. She's caught in the two, three, it's going to be who she the next song with me. The song that you'll know the chorus of, whether you know you know it or not, you do. It's called Molly Malone. And I was once teaching this to children. And I read through the song, first of all, and I came to the bit about the ghost. And they all started yakking about ghosts. They were about seven, eight years of age. My brother thinks it's one in the closet. My father says it's nonsense. My mother said she saw one. My sister thinks seven-year-old child said, hush, I'll tell you what ghosts are. So we all shut up and she said, ghosts, she said, are dead people with issues. <laughs> and now I, I knew some of her neighbors and I, 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 I had to follow her career. And I found that this, this little article, she became a goth in her teenage years. Black fingernails, unreachable to her parents. They thought there was a stranger in the house. And today, she's finishing up her PhD in education. So I knew there was something special about that child. I also promised the class I would send them a postcard of, of, of a photo of Molly Malone. But then uh, she's popping out of her dress. I mean, tray decollecte. So I sent them some 
pictures of sheep and cows and stuff. In Dublin Fair City, where the girls are so pretty, first set my eyes and take my lead along. As she reads her wheelbarrow, puts feet sprawling on the narrow, bright cockles, muscles, alive, alive, born. Good chance now, alive, alive, born. somebody's going to arrive unexpectedly, or maybe it's on the other elbow, somebody's going to depart unexpectedly. But here's one I think this is either absolutely absurd or brilliant. How do you cure whooping cough? Simple. You eat a loaf of bread baked by a woman who married a man with the same surname. <laughs> Job is done. Now, on the other hand, it might be just they aced the whole placebo effect because if you're invested in these beliefs, maybe you have the power to mix yourself. I don't know. I'm not going to argue with the folklore. Uh, I'd like to play a tune. I have another little instrument here called a tin whistle. Sure there's no beasties inside it. I play a little tune called Re Neshiog, and it reflects the uh, ancient beliefs that uh, a lot of the rural people had, and some still probably do. There's a phenomenal building about 50 miles northwest of Dublin in County Meath called Newgrange, and this building is older than the pyramids. It was built over 5,400 years ago. It's a circular building. It's got a gap over the entrance like that, and it admits perfectly aligned with the winter solstice, which is the 21st of December. And when the sun, of course it's Ireland, the sun may or may not make its uh, uh, arrival, but in the event it does, it turns this corridor bronze gold color, about the length of the room here, and then there's a big, big stone at the end. We don't really know the specifics of what the practices were. It maybe had to do with uh, sending souls off with this new light in the winter solstice, or make up your own bit. Anyway, here's a lovely little tune to commemorate that phenomenon of this. The tune is called Re Neshiog, it translates to the King of the Fairies.
I think it's on the side of the Irish language, just to give you a, a taste of the sounds of it. It uh, became not useful in terms of uh, mercantile activity by the early 1700s and it started to fade out. At the moment, there's about 3 or 4% of the population who are fluent speakers, that is, they learn it as children in the home. And there's six areas around the country with government protection and tax relief and all kinds of things to try to keep these communities together where they speak only Irish in the shops and pubs and supermarkets, etc. They're known as Gwaeltop areas. I learned it as a second language in school. The science thing for you, it's about a fellow called Phelan and he's in his boat off the coast of Donegal, he's fishing, and the chorus describes his boat as being sleek and sturdy and fast and beautiful. And he's visiting the little islands off the coast of Galway, of uh, sorry, Donegal. One is Gaula Island and the other is Tory, which is where the word Tory came from. T-O-R-A-I-D-H means a rebel in the Irish language. So the Tory party at one time were a rebel party, and that's how they got their name. Back to the song, and then he becomes a victim of his success. He catches so much fish that his boat capsizes. There's just a couple of verses in it, just to give you the the feel of the, the, the language. survivors, I see. It's a simple dish. It's basically cabbage and mashed potatoes, or kale and mashed potatoes. And you might zip it up a bit with some uh, scallions and chives or cigarette butts. Or, you know, whatever's handy. <laughs> and in the third verse of the song, it mentions a character from folklore called a Clurachon. Clurachon is a little squireen about this high, impeccably dressed, who come into your house in the dead of night and eat all your food and drink your drink. Great excuse. Wasn't me brushing the crumbs away. It must have been the Zurichon. <laughs> 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 
This instrument, by the way, is called a Bauron. The spelling is really upsetting. B O D H R A Father N, stroke over the A. It means, it translates to deafener. Did you have a hound called Cannon made with lots of pickled greens? But the greens are scanning its pink and I can picture in the dream. Did you make a little hole on top of the hole the green you played with the sweet and melt and butter that your mother used to make? Oh, you did, so you did, so did she, and so did I. And the more I think about it, oh, the nearer I'm to cry. Weren't them the happy days, troubles we knew not? Our mother made Carl Cannon in the little skillet pot. Did you ever take potato cake or box tea to the school? Tucked underneath your lobster, which your bosun's like to rule. The teacher wasn't looking, sure a great big bite you take. With the creamy flavor, soft and melted sweet potato cake. Oh, you did, so you did, so did she, and so did I. And the more I think about it, oh, the nearer I'm to cry. Weren't them the happy days, the troubles we knew not? Our mother made cow cannon in the little skillet pot. Did you ever go a court and last when the evening sun went down? Oh, the moon began the peeping from behind the hill of down. Did you wander down the barry where the tour of con was seen? As you whispered loving for aces to your own dear sweet colleague. Oh, you did, so you did, so did she, and so did I. And the more I think about it, oh, the nearer I'm to cry. Weren't them the happy days, troubles we knew not? Our mother made call Karen in the little skillet pot. Is it Irish the same as Gaelic? Yeah, we call it, refer to the Irish language as Irish. Yeah. Here's a song that was voted. The uh, people of Ireland were asked to vote for their favorite folk song. This is the one that won. The song called Raglan Road. It was written by one of the poets, Patrick Kavanagh, who fell deeply for a woman called Hilda. And uh, Hilda didn't requite his advances. <laughs> so she actually uh, was dated by an Irish politician called Des O'Malley from Limerick. And he eventually became Minister of Education, quite a uh, good one at that. And uh, Des O'Malley and Hilda would go on dates and they'd allow Patrick Hamlet to tag along. They were very kind to him. He was a kind of a forlorn individual, but a wonderful poet. And he wrote this song about his unrequited love to Hilda. It's one of those songs that's got facets. It, every time I hear it or sing it, something else reveals itself. That's probably why it's such a the beloved song to the Irish people. On Raglan Road of an autumn day, I saw her first. And you that her dark hair might weave a snare that I might someday rue. I saw the danger and I passed along the enchanted way. And I said, Let grief be a falling leaf at the dawning of the day. On Grafton Street in November. Sound and 
strong. Her words and tint without stint, I he gave her poems to say. With her own name there and her own dark hair, like clouds over fields of May. to go to work in England uh, to get money for their school fees and the like, uh, for pocket money. And uh, so here's a fella who goes over to England. He's a graduate student, very confident young man. Goes to the foreman and he says, uh, you have any work for me? The foreman says, do you know anything about construction? He says, of course, Just ask me any question you like. So the foreman says, what's the difference between a girder and a joist? Oh, he said, that's easy. Joyce wrote Finnegan's Wake and Gertha wrote Faust. <laughs> anyway, here's a song about a fellow had a terrible accident on a construction site. If you need a good excuse not to go, well, she will probably retire, but a few of you might be working. If you need a good excuse, listen closely, and you can adapt it. Oh, dear boss, I write this letter to you to tell you of my plight. And at the time of writing, I am not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deadly grey. And I hope you'll understand why Paddy's not at work today. I was working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. And throwing them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased to be an awkward son. Said I'd have to carry them down the ladder in my hall. Now shifting all the bricks by hand seemed so awful slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured the rope below. But in my haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. Now when I came down and cut the rope, the barrel fell like lead. But clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. 
I shot up like a rocket, but to my dismay I found. Halfway up I met the bloody barrel coming down. Now the barrel broke my shoulder bones to the ground and sped. And when I reached the top, I struck the pulley with my head. Now I come on, though no one's shot from this almighty blow. While the barrels spilled out half the bricks, 14 floors below. Now when those bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel and I started down once more. Still clinging tightly to the rope, I headed for the ground and landed on the building bricks scattered all around. As I lay there moaning on the floor, I thought I'd pass the worst, but the barrels from the pulley wheel and didn't the bottom burst. A shower of bricks came down with me, so I haven't got to hope. And as I was losing consciousness, I let go of the flipping rope. Now the barrel being heavier started down once more, landed right to cross me as I lay there on the floor. I broke three ribs and my left arm, and I can only say that I hope you understand why Paddy's not that one. St. Patrick's Day has come and gone. I must tell you, as a child in Ireland, watching the St. Patrick's Day parade in the 50s and 60s, even as a child, I was particularly unimpressed. <laughs> the whole society was all about, don't put your head up, don't get noticed, just keep your head down, carry on with your life. And there were parade, it was a parade of that. They were embarrassed by it. The soldiers were stern enough and they marched and the Navy marched and three jets from the Irish, all of the three jets from the Irish Air Force flew over Dublin, Cork, Limerick, all the way and were home for their dinner. And uh, the whole thing, there was a few industrial floats and the people operating it were mortified to be doing their business. It was honest to God. And then, then, then the self-confidence started to come up on the Irish people. American marching bands came over with the jazzy instruments swinging around, and girls in short skirts throwing sticks up in the air. Everybody said, we can do that. And now it's a fabulous affair. You can probably watch it on YouTube if you could just sum it up yesterday's St. Patrick's Day March in Dublin or Cork or Galway, Limerick, and it's multicultural, there's fabulous displays. It's uh, very impressive. I saw the South Boston one yesterday. I was, actually, I had a gig in a house on Broadway, and I finished my gig, and I was trapped by the parade. I couldn't get to my car, so I watched it. It was uh, interesting. They had about 50 jeeps. I don't know what the hell they were doing there. It was one after another. However, so um, I have a... One of my favorite ballad makers lived in the late 1700s into the 1800s. His name was Michael Moran. He was from the Liberties at Section in Dublin. He, uh, he developed measles as a child and then no vaccinations, of course. And so as a result of that, he would have blinded. And so he turned his talents into ballad making. And he wrote a lot of songs from the Old Testament, but he got bored with the Middle Eastern geography and tossed in the Dublin geography. In the I'll give you an example. Here's one about the finding of Moses that goes, in Egypt's land, contagious to the Nile. The Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe in style. She took her dip and she came unto the land and to dry her old royal pelt she ran along the strand. But then a bulrush tripped her whereupon she saw a little baby in a wad of straw. She took it to the Pharaoh, said he in accents mild and grand, Thought that Jesus Christ Almighty girl, where did she get the child? <laughs> Your biblical chronology is about to kick in here, I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, old woman, I search every nook, from the Phoenix Park down to Donnybrook. And if I catch the little basket's father, I'll chase him from the River Nile onto the River Daughter. That's how he dealt with the finding of Moses. He also has one about St. Patrick, a great song. But it's, most of the songs about Patrick are hymns, and I don't do hymns, I just do folk songs. This is one he wrote called St. Patrick was a gentleman. He has a mouth chasing women, drinking and smoking. He wanted to call it Saints Just Wanna Have Fun. <laughs> Here we go with St. Patrick was a gentleman. St. Patrick, incidentally, was brought to Ireland as a slave. The slaver was a fellow called Niall Niguilot, which translates to Niall of the Nine Hostages. And then we're told that St. Patrick made his escape in a boatload of Irish wolfhounds. However, uh, Niall of the Nine Hostages 
who's a bit of a lad, he has about 8% of all Irish people have his DNA in their makeup. So check your... <laughs> it doesn't say now with the night houses, it goes back to somebody dating around at that time who uh, was responsible for a lot of children. And it's assumed to be Niall of the Nine Hostages. He was a, as I say, Genghis Khan now, interestingly enough, has about 12% of Central Asia with his DNA sample, and uh, he came 700 years after the Battle of Nile. Here we go. <laughs> Was a gentleman, he came of decent people. He went to church in Dublin town upon the foot to steep. His father was a calicur, his mother was a grady. His aunt was an O'Shaughnessy, and see, his uncle was a brady. Wicklow Hills are very high, and so is the hill of Holzer. There's a hill much higher, still much higher, on the Bolzer. On the top of that high hill, St. Patrick preached a sermon. Drove the frogs into the box and banished all the vermin. To save themselves from slaughter. They hunted thousand vipers, blue with turbans, sweet discourses. Tighten them with killing and soup and second horse. The vipers come and in the grass disgusted all the nation. Down to hell with the holy spell, he changed their situation. and families and fallen Anglo-Normans came over from Wales and they were able to pretty much defeat anybody they met. A year later, 4,000 uh, armed men came over with King John and claimed the whole country for themselves. But they didn't manage to make incursions apart from the east coast, it was the area known as the Pale. And then later on, Queen Elizabeth then said, oh, to all the Irish chieftains, you can have an English title and uh, we'll leave you alone, and you can, you can uh, proceed. But if you took that title, with it came garrison soldiers, British justice system. The Irish justice system was interesting in that it was more to do with restoring the person rather than punishing them. For instance, if you had somebody damage your vegetable garden of their cattle straight into it, they had to re repair the damage they did and replace the vegetables that were destroyed. If you cause somebody public embarrassment, you paid a blush fine of uh, maybe a half dozen eggs or something like that. It wouldn't work in today's society, would it? Sitting outside some CEO's mansion, trying to embarrass them. Good luck with that, huh? Anyway, this did work somewhat, I guess, in the old days. It had a sense of uh, shame. <clears throat> This was all leading up to a song and I've forgotten what it is. Oh yeah, that's quite all right. So, I was a school teacher for one year and the children used to encourage what they call red herrings. Send me off on a little tributary. That's, that's fun. It's a, a rebel song. And uh, this one goes back to, uh, I do O'Donnell, a verse or two of O'Donnell Abu. 
the Irish government in the 1980s agreed to offer a courtesy recognition if you could prove you were a chieftain. You had to get your bona fides together, get professional genealogists to prove you were the eldest son of the eldest son, going back to the last known chieftain. And so they managed, 20 people managed to establish themselves as chieftains. The Irish government kind of withdrew from the program when one of these chieftains started to act, uh, try to leverage his chieftainship into some commercial venture, and the government withdrew their support. However, they still meet. There's a, there's a descendant of Brian Boru still living. Um, he has a pedigree that's, I'm told, is 34 feet long. It goes back before Brian Boru, back to about 200 BC, with fairly creditable accuracy because genealogy was so important to these old chieftains that they had records and records and records until they started to get a little fanciful and going back to Noah. That was a bit of a stretch for them there. Or some of them went back to the, the mythological first arrivals, the king, the sons of the king of Spain, Mills, M-I-L-S, Heber, Ur, and I forget the other chap. They, they tried to go back to those legendary characters, and so then it fall, falls apart. But fairly accurate going back, you know, to before Christ and so on. So here's uh, one of the songs from the chieftains O'Donnell Abu, which I understand has been adopted by the AOH as their official anthem. The O'Donnells uh, fled Ireland in 1607, during the, uh, just after the death of Queen Elizabeth I. And uh, they went off to Rome and they went to Spain and the Catholic countries of Europe. Here we go. <laughs> Solve the Northern Ireland problem. He very generously offered to come over there and rule as a king, <laughs> and that he would treat both sides of the sectarian barrier equally. And uh, he didn't get a reply. <laughs> Interesting man. He's uh, he lives life quite large. His name is uh, Don Hugo O'Neill. He has a winery in, in Estancia. <laughs> There's a group in Ireland that are disfavoured by much of the society, and I, I, I know quite a lot about them. They used to be referred to as tinkers, but now they prefer to be known as travellers. The word tinker has become a pejorative. If you make a derogatory comment about somebody who's African-American or from Africa, or somebody who's Jewish, they'd be quickly censored by your group. But if you made a negative comment about the travellers, nobody would say a word. Even. Even a judge in, 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 in a position of great authority remarked, read in the papers a while ago, he said, the travellers, you're like Neanderthals skulking in the long grasses. Now, when somebody of authority makes a comment like that, people down the road interpret it otherwise, and vulnerable people all of a sudden are attacked and abused with the authority of a judge. Anyway, here's a song, uh, I, when it was a, just finished school before I went to college and met up with a, a traveller and he was quite renowned in Ireland. He had a nickname which confuses people here. He used to ride horses for a major peckinum, so he got the nickname the Pecker Dung. 
<laughs> and in Ireland, your pecker is your nose because it pecks, peck, peck. There you go. Glad to clarify that. Anyway, he wrote a wonderful song that became part of the folklore, the folk tradition called Sullivan's John, about a settled man who runs away with a band of travelers. And uh, he's an interesting guy himself. He, uh, his grandmother was Romany, so he intermarried with the Romany people at some point. He had a big, big head on him. And, uh, he's, uh, you can YouTube him. He's got lots of stuff out there. Very interesting fellow. I used to travel around with him. We'd go to horse fairs and we'd busk on the streets and we didn't get invited in to play in pubs and pass the hat around. He was a great character. He'd come in with the whole his banjo over the air and he said, my father gave me this and told me as long as I could play it, I'd never starve. At which point he'd slap his big belly, which was mostly beer. And he'd say, we're going to pass a collection. If you can't afford to donate, smile, but we don't want to see too many smiles. <laughs> it's a great pitch. Oh, Sullivan's John, to the road you go, far away from your native home. You're gone with the tinker's daughter, or along the road to Rome. Sullivan's John, though you won't stick it long, for your belly will soon grow slack. Home in the road with the mighty load and a toolbox on your back. I met Kennedy Cafe with her neat baby behind on her back strap on. She did an old ash plant held in her hand for to drive her donkey on. Inquiring at every farmer's house as along the road she passed. It's where would I get to go to pot to bed? Or it's where can I sell an ass? Now I heard of a fair in the county Clare, in a place they call Spansel Hill, where my brother James got a rap of the hames and poor Paddy they tried to kill. They loaded him up in the old ass and cart by a gate and the baby looked out. decided, okay, you guys are going to move off the roads. Most of them were staying in improvised dwellings and their caravans and their barrel top wagons with a little stovepipe to the roof. It would, it would sleep about four people and the others would camp outside in, in tents that they made. The Irish government said, no, you got to settle down. And for two years, they harassed them and kept them moving. But then again, neighbors didn't want them living alongside them. So it was a terrible dynamic going on for seven years. Eventually the government provided them with the halting sites so they could pull their wagons and trucks in there and uh, have facilities for cleaning and taking care of themselves. Now there's pretty much all settled. There's a few, very few hardcore still live out in the rough on the sides of the road. Wintertime is very tough on them. Here's a, a, one of the families that um, finally gave up traveling on the roads and moved to Dublin became a very famous musical group called the Fury Brothers. And the father was Ted Fury, a great fiddle player and a great storyteller. He was a great character. I got to know them. And uh, one of the sons wrote a beautiful piece of music called The Lonesome Boatman. I'll play it for you. Also, uh, the Irish government has, the Department of Education has, uh, now they've got a, a factor where they teach children about the Irish travellers and their community and their culture. So it hopes to lessen some of the aggravation 
that uh, they receive. Here's a lonesome boatman for you. I do a little bit about the rebellion in Ireland of 1916. Home rule had been offered since the 1880s and various reasons that the House of Commons received it, the House of Lords rejected it, it was put in again some years later. Eventually they had an agreement but then the First World War came along and it was tabled. And some of the proponents who wanted home rule got tired of waiting and decided to have a rebellion. There were three of them were school teachers, one of them was a poet, another was a labor leader, and another guy was, I don't know what he was anyway. They were a, kind of an intellectual group who uh, knew they were going to fail. They purposely had the rebellion at Easter time, knowing that their sacrifice would resonate with the deeply Catholic communities. So the rebellion kicked off on Easter Monday and it lasted until the following Saturday. The British brought a troops over and at the end of the week there were 500 dead. About 200 of them were British soldiers, 170 insurgents and the rest were civilians. The British had brought a gunship into the harbour and was shelling parts of the city. Accuracy 100 years ago or more was iffy. There was a sweet shop and they're probably the little street urchins in Dublin with their bare feet and drooling at this window for God knows how many years, all, all, all the high class candies. And a shell burst the window open and sweets scattered all over the streets. The children gathered, gathered them up and another shell came. In the heat of the hunt anyway, there were 40 children died in the rebellion. One child reading a book in his bed, a bullet came through the window ending his life. And this was an awful thing at the sweet shop. So when they were led off to, to the ships and to be taken to prison in Britain, the people of Dublin were hurling abuse at them and cursing them for the destruction they wrought in the city. It was not a popular rebellion. However, by the middle of May, they had executed 16 of the leaders. And the Prime Minister of Britain came over and said, you've got to stop the executions. We're losing popular opinion. At that point, they lost it. It was gone. The Irish turned totally. It was almost Shakespearean in the way that they turned and recognized that this awful sacrifice was for them. And here's a song so called the Foggy Dew. <laughs> Angela's fell or the Liffey's 
well. Bring out to the foggy dew. It was England, man, our wild geese flee. That small nations might be free. Their lonely graves are by soldiers waves on the fringe of the great North Sea. people born there now living overseas. However, there's almost 17% of the people living in Ireland who were born overseas. And that's been quite a challenge for the society to accept. There's 100,000 refugees from Ukraine, and then you got asylum seekers and people fleeing climate change and migratory people for, for economic opportunities and so on. So the housing, housing, housing is a big problem there, like it is everywhere it seems to accommodate all these people. And just, uh, you can listen to Irish radio now. It, most, a lot of us have access to computers. It's great fun. I listen to, every morning I listen to the Joe Duffy show. It's great fun. He, uh, the other day there was a woman had dropped her keys behind the seat in a taxi cab. And she was talking about this. They'd been missing for about 80 days at this point, but she had a tracker on them. And she noted on the radio to the, to the host that, her keys had had a great time. They were up and down to Belfast, out to Kildare, out to the airport many times, all over the place. And while she was addressing this problem, didn't her tracker go off? And she told the guy, well, it's on the road to Holt now. And then five minutes later, a man phone said, that taxi just passed my house, I'm getting after it. And then there was a fierce discussion, are you hands free, are you driving safely, you don't want to crash here. Anyway, he caught up, and as he was driving, he says, there's two cars ahead of me now, and many, many of the cars coming towards him are flashing their lights at him. So the whole nation is listening to the radio show, and the hunt is on. It was just delightful. And then another time, I mean, they found the keys eventually, get to stop the car, and reach down behind the seat, and yay, you got the keys. Another one was a very experienced broadcaster called Carl O'Connell, was interviewing a lady from the Aran Islands, who just reached the wonderful age of 100. Now you must remember now, her first language would have been Irish, and her second language would have been English. And so he said to her, You've had a wonderful life, and I understand you've never been bedridden in your life. She said, oh, I was, several times, and once in a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that on cable television. <laughs> Is that what you are, you cable television? That's a surprise to me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's two o'clock, and I've got to let you go home. You've got babysitters, and God knows what to do, shopping. And the, 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 the. I'll finish up with a song called The Parting Glass which is, uh, if you ever watched the movie Ned Devine, it was featured in that with the voice squad singing it. And the Chelsea's used to end their performances with the parting glass. It's about a fella anticipating his own death. Should be a pint of Guinness or something. You know? <laughs> Certain library protocols. <laughs> oh, of all the money that e'er I've had, I have spent it in good company. And of all the harm that e'er I've done, alas, 
it was to none but me. And all that I've done for want of wit to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Oh, there is a fair maid in this town. I own she has my heart beguiled. And if I had money enough to spend or leisure for to stay a while, her ruby lips and rosy cheeks, I own she has my heart in thrall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night, and joy be with you all. Oh, of all the comrades that e'er I've had, they are sorry for my going away. And of all the sweethearts that e'er I've known, would wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I will gently rise and I'll softly call. Good night. And joy be with you all. Thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. <laughs>